friends, Michael Goldberg, and I'm our executive director of the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship here at, at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm also a professor of the Weatherhead School of Management sitting in my office. Um, and it's great to welcome uh, Myra back to campus today. Uh, we were just chatting before how usually she's on campus twice a year in person and in the new world order, it's all things Zoom. Uh, but we're thrilled to have Myra participate in our, our CWRU um, Entrepreneurship Alumni Speaker Series. And the session, as all of our sessions are, are moderated by students, which is great. So um, Shama, who is a um, electrical, what's your case school of engineering, electrical engineering with a concentration in robotics and computer hardware. Oh, how cool. Got it all. <laughs> um, so Shama's going to be our student moderator today. Um, for those that are joining up us on Zoom, just let Shama know in the chat if you'd have a question. And ideally, we'd love for you to unmute and ask Myra directly. And if you're on LinkedIn Live, just put a note in the comment um, about uh, a question that you have. And Doug, Dijeralamo, and I will be monitoring LinkedIn Live and let Shama know of uh, the question. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Shama. Hello everyone, my name is Sean Magirish and I'm an electrical engineering major and a data science minor at Case Western Reserve University. Today I have the pleasure to have a conversation with our speaker today, Myra. Myra is the founder and CEO of Houston-based Pearl Resources LLC. She's been recognized as one of the most influential women in energy, which really reflects her success as an entrepreneur and as a woman navigating the energy sector. So Myra, could you please tell us more about your background, schooling, and leadership journey that led you to flirt? Sure. And uh, I graduated from Case with an undergraduate degree in polymer engineering back in 1976, a long time ago. <laughs> but um, like I said, I've been back to campus a number of times and have really enjoyed. Actually, I got on the dean's uh, uh, visiting committee back, started back in 1995. So I've seen a lot of changes take place in the Case campus since that time. Uh, and and so I'm in Houston, Texas right now, and uh, undergoing uh, quite a bit of uh, energy transformation that's taking place in industry today. Uh, and I certainly can cover a little bit of that. But um, oil and gas, I got involved in oil and gas when I started with Standard Oil of Ohio, so Ohio up in Cleveland. Uh -huh. um, Believe me, when I started at Case, I had no idea I'd be in, end up in oil and gas. Um, I thought uh, polymers was a great opportunity, and that's where I got my degree and started at Ohio in polymers. And then they acquired uh, oil field up in Alaska, Prudhoe Bay, and they needed technical people. They had no technical support for development up there at the time. And so uh, I got sent up to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, we didn't eight, pro eight weeks of special project up there and uh, found it fascinating. I knew nothing about oil and gas. I really had no idea. I, I thought it was a big straw you put, <laughs> wells were big straws you put down in a hole and it reached a big cavern under the ground and all you had to do, it had to do was suck hard on it. <laughs> That's uh, pretty much what I, my, my background in oil and gas. Um, However, I, I was involved in some facilities work up there and I had uh, some processing background uh, from my great chemical engineering background I had at Case. And so uh, I was involved in seawater filtration and some of the initial seawater treatment facilities up at Prudhoe. And then, but I got fascinated with downhole and went back to graduate school and I have a doctorate in petroleum engineering from University of Texas. Um, and I moved down to Austin and uh, proceeded to get my degree um, in about six years. And I graduated in 88 with my PhD. Um, and then I went to work for Shell in enhanced oil recovery, uh, primarily in thermal and CO2 processes for uh, recovery. Um, that was fascinating, um, learned a lot, but that's also when I realized that I was going to have to after working for, for Shell and there weren't many women and I had bosses that really didn't want women in, in business to begin with. So I eventually saw that it would be best if I start, struck out on my own. Um, and so for the next basically 13 years, I undertook my own development program that I designed and implemented myself um, because I knew 
although I had a, a technical background and I did really good technical work um, where I saw my op aptitude would be to work in the business. And I had not a business degree at the time. Um, but I did end up when I went to Western Atlas, I was a division manager for a new development team that they wanted to do international studies on national oil for national oil companies. And I did a lot of work for Pemex. Um, I would do the request, I would respond to the request for proposals, go down, evaluate the data, come back, write up a proposal. And then if I were awarded the proposal, I would hire the staff to implement <laughs> the, the program. So I became project manager as well as going out and getting additional projects. Projects. Um, from that, uh, I basically get, learned a, 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 an MBA. I had my own PL. I had my own, uh, which was critical for me to, for the technical degree. Um, I found management always wanting to stick me back into a technical area um, to get me out of management. So I fought the, the uh, I swam upstream and uh, worked real hard to work on the management side on developing uh, financial skills there. And uh, later on, I went to Schlumberger, uh, Western Atlas got bought. I moved to Schlumberger, did the same thing, started up a new division with them, had P&L responsibility, bid projects, won them and continued to do that. And then Amico made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I thought, well, gee, Amico's big enough with all this consolidation that was happening in the industry too. Um, I thought, well, gee, this is great. I'll go to Amico because they should be buying someone else, right? <laughs> well, after three years at Amico, they caught, bought, bought by BP. And I ran into the same people that I used to work with at Prudhoe Bay <laughs> that were worth so while that had been absorbed by BP. In any case, small world. Um, and I worked at, I was actually technology director for uh, Amico in their e uh, R&D, but I had basically a P&L uh, to run, and that was on reservoir and production management. Uh, I had about staff of about 75 PhDs that were working in my department, so it was fairly significant, and uh, we developed fracking, hydraulic fracturing, and reservoir engineering, enhanced oil recovery, and everything that was important under the ground. Um, and then BP came in and bought Amico, and I moved on to doing uh, some really interesting studies down in Latin America for Lord Brown. And we presented a white paper to Lord Brown uh, on gas resources in South America, which I did the resource assessment. Somebody else was doing the transportation and marketing of natural gas in Latin America. And we presented that to Lord Brown, and he, he really accepted it. And uh, I went on to become the chief of staff for the North American business president for BP. It goes on from there. And I learned a lot about management and then um, was asset manager for producing unit business unit within BP and then decided to strike. Finally, after all this training, I decided it was time to do my own business. So I started Open Resources, which was backed by private equity uh, within Goldman Sachs. Um, that was a very successful undertaking. And after three years, we sold it for 400 million. And I moved on to form my own company, uh, Pearl Resources, which Opal was working in the Midland Basin of the Permian. And I moved over into the Delaware Basin, which was much more exploratory in nature and properties could be picked up at a lot lower cost. So that's where I'm at today. That's Pearl Resources. And that's kind of the path I followed to get there. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing um, that background. Uh, you touched a little bit about how being female, it was a little bit difficult to get out of that technical and then do more leadership. So currently as CEO, do you still find that you have to debacle the sexism, even though you're in such a high position? Oh, it's huge. Yeah. Especially in the financial markets. Uh, private equity is hugely biased against women. Uh, yes, there is some improvements, but especially in energy, you won't find very many women on board of directors. And it's the board of directors that really make the, there's two, two areas of power within entrepreneurship. And one is your uh, private equity. And if you're not, don't have women in that investment committee, they might be managing directors, but if they're not in that investment committee, they're not really in that decision-making process. So getting women exposed into that market is real critical. Um, the, 
the other aspect, although the major oil companies and the major energy entities are moving more women into uh, board of director positions, um, there's a whole slew of intermediate mid caps, Devons, the uh, Conchos, for example, other public and smaller companies that don't have any women in board of directors positions, none. And nor do they have them in their C-suite. So you won't find women <laughs> in their management, maybe yes, in HR, but that's about it. So um, it's, it's really tough and um, they just, there's a lot of folks in private equity is one of them that just don't feel that they look at you and they say, well, I don't know whether I want to place $400 million in your pocketbook, Mara, you know, you're, 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 you're a woman. <laughs> and, and that's despite a very, very successful um, track record. Um, I used to be head of drilling for BP's Midcontinent Business Unit and was managing $655 million a year in drilling contracts. And, uh, activities there. So it's, it blows my mind. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so we have a question from the chat um, from Robert Smith. He asks, can you talk more about your Purdue Bay experience right out of school? My experience, I didn't quite catch all that. What was that, Sharma? Bob, if you want to unmute and ask him. Yeah, um, when you went up to Prudhoe Bay, I, you were right out of school, right? And I'm assuming there weren't too many women on that crew. Could you talk about that experience? <laughs> yes, it was. Um, in fact, when I, because I lived up on the slope for uh, eight weeks. And um, uh, actually, when I flew up to Alaska, they wouldn't let a, a corporate male fly up with me I had to fly by myself because they didn't want a corporate man flying with a single lady up to Prudo. anyway um, once I got up there then they didn't have really the dormitories um, you know it was we were put into uh, you know they were uh, trailer camps basically that were on stilts they had to keep them off the permafrost so uh, I was only woman on the slope in many cases, and they just didn't have all the facilities. They, they even today uh, on some of the rigs, especially when you're uh, offshore, they don't have rig, rig facilities for women separately. Oh so that is an ongoing problem. Were you, uh, were you nervous? Were you scared? Um, no, I wasn't necessarily scared, but I was always on my guard. Mm -hmm. And um, if nothing else, because uh, I, I guess I was always a bit more aloof um, in order to not be interpreted as trying to be attractive, but let me put it in blunt terms. I was trying mm -hmm. to remain focused on the job at hand and be very, very, um, strictly business only type of sure. attitude. Yeah. And what was your support network there? Did you have a mentor? Did you have someone who watched out for you? Well, I did have a, a mentor and he was actually head of tech service. So he was fairly highly placed. Um, and, and he's the one that actually felt that uh, this was a great opportunity for me. I think it's incredible throughout your career that you find um, a mentor and uh, be quite honest, you have to find somebody, a, a male who is in management, who is willing to take you under your um, wing and guide you and provide consultation, at least be that ear and can point you in the right direction. I think that's real critical. I found that to be true throughout my career that um, I, I found very good support as long as I, this is the demise of with all the corporate changes that were occurring, all my buddies that were supporting me at various companies got laid off during the mergers. So they whittled them all down. So I had to move on. And that does happen when there's corporate more mergers. And if you happen to be in the company that's getting um, purchased, uh, you may have had good support within that entity, but lose it after that merger. So imperative that you find the right channels to move into. 
fascinating. Yeah. You don't plan, you can't plan for this. I mean, uh, like I said, I would never have guessed when I attended school at Case that I would be in oil and gas today. Um, but I was also naive. I was busy all through college and even high school. Uh, I wasn't in, although I went to public schools and to Case, um, because I was a competitive figure skater also, uh, a lot of my life was not at school, but it was away and was focused on figure skating and achieving goals there. And I was naive. <laughs> I, I, you know, we went, would go and compete and I thought all things were fair. And, um, you know, later on, as I got older, then I realized there was a lot of politics and figure skating as well, mm -hmm. um, if not more so. And, um, but I still thought if you proved yourself, in other words, if you were the champion, <laughs> that, yeah. that, that things would, would be opening up. I mean, I was told always on, well, there just aren't that many women who can qualify for being CEOs or in the C-suite. And that's just simply not true today. I know of a huge amount of very talented women, but it's just not enough to uh, compensate for the lack of of uh, presence in corporate boardrooms. Could, could I get you to talk about figure skating a little bit? I, <laughs> I think people should know that Myra was like a national class figure skater, okay? Like, you know, she was seen as Olympic potential. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, what gives someone the courage and the moxie to be an entrepreneur and to be a pioneer, which you were. And I wonder if figure skating had something to do with it. Well, it certainly helped. Um, there's one thing that you learn in figure skating is that you fall a lot. You fall a lot. And the only way you get better is you pick yourself up and go do it again and get it right because then you'll succeed. So uh, I spent a whole lot of time falling and then picking myself and perseverance. And um, it, it works both to foreign guests. Maybe it's you hang on to things too long and you got to cut bait and move on. Um, but but uh, it, it definitely gave me uh, a level of self-confidence that really helped throughout my career. And then as I progressed into uh, in oil and gas, there were a lot, there, be, there are gonna be a ton of people who wanna put up roadblocks, wanna put those speed bumps in front of you to slow you down and get you exasperated. And it is frustration. You, you will see a whole lot of frustration. And the problem is, is that uh, if you get frustrated and walk away, they've won. So you've got to be hard and persevere and try to learn what it will take that makes it different. Uh, somebody sets up a roadblock. So you step right and try something else or you step left and do something else and um, take opportunities when they're presented because sometimes it's the unexpected that opens up a new opportunity. So, you know, as the saying, so when door closes, another one opens, that's very much the truth. And you have to take uh, the, the opportunities and realize that you've got, uh, you've made it this far. So you're doing something right. Anybody, any woman who is in uh, engineering at college has done something right. Okay. And that should yield a huge amount of self-confidence. And like I said, there's going to be always folks that want to put speed block, speed bumps or put roadblocks in front of you. And you just have to work your way around them. It's just yeah. easier when you have somebody looking out for you, when that mentor can help you uh, move around those speed blocks. Definitely. So we have a question from Herb. So he asks, what steps are you taking to help women break through these barriers? And he adds on that, like what he appreciates what you're doing now, but he just wants to learn more about some of the steps that you've taken. Well, uh, there's, uh, I'm trying to provide some guidance by talking with women. I would really like to get into a board position, but right now I'm fighting too many other battles with um, the industry being in such dire straits. Uh, it, it, it uh, you know, working very slim handed with very few staff. Um, I'm doing basically watching my company on a day to day basis, overseeing field operations uh, remotely. So uh, there are other women, however, we do network and we're able to find 
I'm able to find other women who I do know that can provide uh, those networking opportunities that could possibly lead to open up that door. So the best I can do right now in my role is to open those doors uh, and at least introduce you to other uh, women or even men that can help uh, potentially find another opportunity. Right now, the oil and gas is in a huge transition, as you might expect. I mean, there's a lot of alternate energies coming up. And I do think that women in energy, there's huge amounts of opportunity for women to move into alternate energies, uh, wind farms, uh, solar, um, and actually biodiesel has been pretty big. Uh, I, I know of a couple women that had gone into biodiesel, for example. So there are opportunities out there. Um, and to learn that technology and move into it. Yeah, um, since we were talking actually about these different um, alternatives, uh, due to recent climate changes, does your company take action to reduce its ecological footprint or um, are there any actions that you're taking to reduce um, the impact on the environment? Oh, well, right now my operations is pretty small. <laughs> I don't have much uh, environmental impact, but there, but there are efforts going on right now to reduce gas flaring, for example. Um, some of it has been, uh, you know, what it is, an oil gas producer only has effect over their own wells and that we have to hook up to pipelines and we don't control the pipelines necessarily. Although some companies like ExxonMobil do own the pipelines that they deliver to, but most of us don't. And so when the pipelines get full, there's only one alternative you have. You either shut in your wells or you flare the gas. Uh, if you're only producing gas, you shut them in because you can't deliver the gas to market. But for everybody else that is primarily producing oil and gas as a byproduct, they flare the gas and produce the oil. And that's, you know, there's been some efforts actually to re-inject gas uh, in, in some of the areas, but that's pretty minimal right now. Great, yeah, and then uh, we have another question from Robert, if you wanted to mute yourself. Well, I'm wondering if, if being a woman ever helped you in the oil industry. I wonder if you like, um, you know, they talk about the value of that fresh set of eyes. I wonder if you've sometimes found yourself bringing a perspective other people didn't see before. Oh, yeah. In fact, that's uh, the reason I called uh, Opal Resources and then Pearl Resources. My tagline is finding gems missed by others. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my Opal's success was actually picking up fringe uh, acreage that nobody else, both Pioneer and Chesapeake had drilled wells and had been unsuccessful. They were plug and abandoned six months after they were drilled. Um, I went into the area and uh, saw that the rock was actually okay. It was execution was the problem. So we went in and executed much better wells, performed better on a technology application and got very successful wells. Um, and that was the idea behind both Opal, which was successful and then Pearl, which I had an area that I moved into in 2011 where there was nobody other developing it. Okay. Cause there was, although there were pipelines in the area, none of the, none of the wells that had been drilled in the area had been successful. And I was trying to attract money to come in and help me out. And I was unsuccessful in doing that. So that's been a, that's why I'm, it's a struggle right now. The area has been very successful, by the way. So uh, a, a very large independent called Parsley Energy, it's a publicly traded company, just got bought by Pioneer for, uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, $7 billion. They own the prop. They came in and bought the property around me and uh, drilled very successful wells and has been trying to force me out of business since then. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, I need to write a I need to get a ghostwriter to help me yes. write a book. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, well, let, I have one more question I wanted to ask. You know, so would you recommend the energy industry to a woman? I mean, they wouldn't be a pioneer like you you were, and you seem to find it a lot of fun, a lot of challenge. Well, right now it's not much fun, but okay, right. I, I will tell you that people don't understand the technology, the level of technology that's involved in oil and gas. They just, you know, they have their image of this, you know, 
oil derrick out there blowing oil out the top kind of spindle spindle top and it's not that way i mean it's very we're using um my husband's also an oil and gas he did fiber optic he does fiber optics and this is a defense technology and we're using it to uh, run in along the, the the casing on the wells in order to uh, determine where the fracks are occurring and how they're being propagated and to even measure fluid movement uh, inside the well bore down hole, you know, 20,000, two miles away or actually three miles away from where the wellhead is at. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of, we're using uh, artificial intelligence, uh, seismic technology, the coherency, um, which is used in uh, actually eye operations and looking at different fluid densities and things like that. So very highly technical in a lot of different areas, such as I, I use every aspect of my technical background, electrical engineering, computers, I mean, when I was at Case, we were still using cards. So uh, I decided to, when I went to back to graduate school, my doctoral thesis was done numerically. So I did numerical modeling <laughs> and decided to force myself into the computer age. So did all the programming in Fortran, but, but it was uh, very, very sophisticated uh, free energy minimization technique. So anyway. Um, so, it, but it, it, it involves all sides, technology, everything, you know, we do directional drilling, GPS, uh, magnetics, uh, we look at gravitational magnetics and how it impacts our ability to measure uh, well bore trajectories. So it, it's just incredibly complicated and involves so many different areas of technology. Um, that's actually uh, really interesting. I didn't know that there were all these different like technology pieces that were um, involved. So kind of going on with that, what type of technology would you like to see be introduced or used more within the energy sector? Well, I do think artificial intelligence, we're just starting to, and it's, be, it's both between infrastructure improvements that we need to have. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of our oil and gas is in remote areas. West Texas is truly out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, like where my operations uh, currently located, I have no electricity. I actually use uh, solar. I use solar to run a lot of my power out there and natural gas. So, um, uh, but, but I do see like artificial intelligence being helpful, uh, remote monitoring, uh, we're using drones. I fly a drone out there to monitor my own property uh, and fly overhead to make sure I have no problems. So there is some, um, you know, opportunities for application. Uh, but our, like I said, our infrastructure, uh, for example, getting cell towers in various, we, we want to do remote management of our wells so we can electrify the wellheads, uh, open closed valves remotely, uh, manage our facilities remotely. And we're still hampered by being able to do that by bandwidth and getting enough uh, uh, support, knowledgeable people on location out in the middle of nowhere in order to support these industries. I feel like using a drone be very helpful, especially due to the times that we live in right now. So mm -hmm. my next question actually has to do with the pandemic. So uh, due to the pandemic, what changes has your company had to do and how has it affected it in terms of financial and growth? Well, myself, um, since my operations are out in Pecos County and I'm sitting here in Houston, I've always been involved fairly heavily with doing remote mon monitoring, okay? So I do fly my drones out there fairly regularly to both not only monitor my own operations, but to see what's happening around me and knowing what's going on. Um, you know, and I, the, the thing is the pandef pandemic, pandemic has kept me from traveling out there. I just, I'm not going out. Because, um, you know, we're tracking outbreaks and it's been pretty bad out in West Texas fairly recently. So I will tell you that what, what the impact has been is that all the oil companies that uh, have uh, in-office staff, they're all working remotely now. Very few go in. This is a great conversation, Myra. Thank you so much for joining today. And Shama, thanks for being such an awesome moderator. Um, I wanted to talk to you about sort of a, a theme that comes up on some of our speaker series is, is around networking. Um, we often have students that 
like Shama that are here studying engineering or other subjects that are sort of looking to get into industry. I'm sort of curious in your perspective as an alum and as somebody that's um, spent your career working in, in energy and oil and gas, as, as case students or young people are looking to connect, what kind of advice do you have for um, our students on, on networking and sort of what works and what maybe doesn't work so well? Well, I found, um, you know, obviously when you get your first job, uh, in my opinion, you can develop a good industry network and it's both within whatever company you're working in and outside of um, that company going to industry meetings. And it's going to be different for every industry, you know, as to what type of connections you can get, you know, in, in I, for example, in oil and gas, a lot of the companies uh, had had their own teams. Like when you went to work for Amico, for example, these teams would always work together for long periods of time if you stayed at the company long enough. My deficiency was that I moved around to different companies too often in order to keep looking at taking that next step, but I didn't develop the network to help support me. And that's a deficiency. I don't have easy answers for that. But that is truly uh, holding me back because so many of the private equity look for these ready-made teams. And guess what? The teams were old teams that came out of Burlington Resources, for example, or Anadarko, or these previous companies that they were longtime um, staff members of like 10 years or so. And they would just move out of that corporate environment, go get private equity. And when I talk about private equity, it depends on the industry. Oil and gas is probably the, the strangest entity. I mean, when you're a startup, you got to get a hundred million. <laughs> it's not pocket change. And, yeah. and so getting, being able to start something in oil and gas, you need private equity. There's no, you can't do it out of your own pocket. Whereas, you know, if you start, you know, a biotech, possibly it might take a lot less smaller amount of investment. And, uh, but I always would, would tell you that you need to go outside and get third party money. <laughs> so, but the networks is important. It, it, having a network and uh, both male, female, you know, try to push yourself, become an extrovert and and network uh, both inside corporations to get ties with people who see different type of opportunities than you may know about yourself. So, um, and that's that. I won't tell tell you it's easy. It's very challenging. You have to push yourself, and that's probably your number. Besides becoming a financial. Uh, wherewithal you have to understand the value of the work you're doing and the markets that it's in so getting that perspective will help gear you uh, toward meeting those industry challenges but but and you only can do that through networking and talking with folks no one knows everything <laughs> so you have to get that different perspective and networking helps you hook up with the right people who can provide that insight to you It's fascinating. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, Herb has typed his question in the chat. He said, you mentioned the importance of getting up after failing. Should students be taught to fail? If yes, how early should they be taught? <laughs> well, I'm not sure anybody needs to be taught to fail. <laughs> I think there's plenty of failures. Um, if they're if they're not failing on their own, then they're not challenging themselves. Let me put it that way. I mean, I, I can't imagine trying to do anything and be perfect the first time you try it. So they're just not trying hard enough <laughs> on challenging themselves. So um, uh, that's I think going out, trying something new uh, and trying to pull in the resources. Maybe it's if it's nothing else, it's just as a, uh, you know, you, you try your first hand at it to put together a group of people to go and do a target development and see what resources are required. Um, 
I underestimated the importance of uh, having that. I not underestimated it. The thing is, I, I had the opportunity to probably go for a master's degree, but after getting a PhD, I was pretty much schooled out. So um, I thought I could learn as much as I could through industry experience. And I do think I, I achieved that. But un unfortunately, third parties don't recognize that necessarily. Um, so, uh, but getting that insight uh, into, uh, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you have to understand the financial situations of any industry, whatever you work. And you have to understand what the market forces that are at play. Really critical. Um, definitely. So while we're talking about failure, can you talk about a setback in your professional life that has helped you get to where you are today? <laughs> yeah, I, it goes back. And I, I, so I do have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit because my father had been, he started his own company too. Um, I guess what started me off from the very start, even though he had his own company, I have an older brother that by two years, okay, and uh, this is a 1950s family, so I will just put it in the context, this is the way it worked in 1950s. My dad said, okay, my brother is going to run his company, and Myra, you could work as a secretary for him in the company, and I said, like, now he was also my skating partners and we didn't get along all that well skating either. But um, I, I said there couldn't be anything further from the truth and something else that was like a gauntlet to me um, because there was just no way, not, nothing against secretaries, but there was no way in hell I was going to work for my, my brother. <laughs> so, so I said, no, I'm going to prove it to my family that I could be successful all on my own. And that's kind of what I set off to do. And that was very, you know, that was very early. Definitely. Um, um, I actually wanted to take it back a little bit and ask a little bit more about your uh, Case Western experience. How was it being a student here? Um, what are some things that you've seen improved? And um, what are some things that you would want, want to be more improved? Well, I certainly had challenges at Case. There were only seven women that graduated in my graduating class of 700. <laughs> so, um, and there were definitely professors who did not want women. I had the famous Leo, um, oh, uh, Lou Green. Uh, he was the math professor. Uh, Green was his last name. Anyway, he didn't want women and, and tried to flunk me out. Um, and I ended up retaking the class. Um, fortunately caught it early enough, but, uh, and, and hopefully that type of stuff doesn't go on. Uh, I do find that uh, with the number of women that are on campus, it's encouraging uh, to see more women on campus. Uh, I've, I'm on the visiting committee and I've been fighting this for a long time uh, about uh, how women's concerns are a bit disregarded um, if they complain about issues, they're disregarded, kind of like, you know, whether it's Anita Hill or you get into a situation like uh, when Ke Brett Kavanaugh was um, confirmed, uh, it was the input was disregarded uh, when it came from a woman. And that still continues pretty broadly. And if you extend that against, you know, you know, the denigration that takes place, you put that into every aspect of business, whether it be um, private equity, um, they, they just disrespect you and they don't take your concerns or your input as a significant. And that's true in uh, the larger companies in oil and gas. Um, you know, I, it's happened multiple times. Uh, I recommended to Marathon had uh, come to me about investing. They, they were trying to pick up fringe uh, uh, properties around me. Okay. And I showed them a play that I was looking at, which was called the Woodford out in the Permian. And I said, you know, here's a great opportunity. You not only pick up the, the deeper Woodford, which is a great opportunity here, you got some shallower plays. Well, then they took that concept, moved about two miles north of where I'm at and bought 40,000 acres <laughs> and, and, and implemented to go after the Woodford, which is what I showed them the play was all about. So, um, 
you know, it, yes, they did regard it, but they didn't want to do just a little bit. They wanted to do a lot of it, but they took the idea and ran with it. And that was happening in the companies too. That's why I moved on my try to develop my own because I saw I was providing all this good insight into the oil companies and, you know, they were, they would have, there were other, there were other political things that were being played rather than do what was best for the corporation. So um, it's the way business works. And that that doesn't that that's not only to women that happens to everybody. But I will tell you that it happens. Uh, women are not taken seriously. Yeah, um, that's that's definitely very true. Um, so uh, another question I had was I I read online that you were once denied an equity partnership because you would not go on a hunting trip. Can you <laughs> um, talk a little bit more about that uh, experience and kind of how that affected you back then, maybe even so presently? Yeah, I mean, there was um, uh, I, so there's a lot of sources of um, money. You go to private equity, but there's also high net worth individuals. You go and try to um, pr promote the ideas about what needs to be invested. And um, that's, you know, high net worth in Houston. There's lots of oil guys out here. And guess what? They own hunting, uh, hunting, hunting lodges up in Montana that they fly to. They've got their planes that they fly up there and go hunting. Now, I did learn golf, okay, when I was at BP. And my manager, who was the business unit manager, told me, Mara, you're not going to succeed in oil and gas unless you learn how to golf. They actually paid for me to take golfing lessons. OK, so and I did. And I learned how to play and I played. I, I, I did OK. I'm athletic. So uh, I played um, uh, Pebble Beach and won the women's trophy on that when I <laughs> golfed out there. <laughs> that was just luck. But um, um, it, it, you know, I recognize that in order to play business development, you had to be out there talking with the people who are doing business. And the way you do that is you talk in, take opportunities to expose yourself in, in uh, business meetings that can evolve deals. Uh, I just put some lines in the sand as to what kind of deals I would participate in and recognize that this was no place for me to go. So, yeah, definitely. Um, and so, first of all, thank you so much for speaking with me today and having this great conversation. I wanted to ask one last question to kind of wrap up this whole thing. And um, oh, we actually have a question from Natalie first. Uh, uh, Natalie, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? All right, I can just read it then. So it says, um, you mentioned sometime extensive industry experience is not recognized in having women manage the business. Do you think an MBA degree helped you overcome that problem? Do you think the MBA program has helped you in becoming a successful entrepreneur? Uh, well, I don't have an MBA, but it's the recognition of uh, understanding financial uh, drivers and metrics. So uh, those are, you, I mean, you, you have to understand where the goalposts, if you're gonna play a game and you're going to be in the game, you under, need to understand where the goalposts are and how to get make the goals and what, what are the drivers behind calling it success. Um, having a successful product that does what you've designed but doesn't meet a market need and won't, people won't pay for it isn't going to do you any good. So you really have to be looking at the financial side of both market as well as investment capital and then the returns on their investment. So um, when you're talking business, you need to speak the language of the business leaders and that's what you have to do. So. Um, that's how you communicate. That's how you get your ideas across and how you are able to sell your concepts. Because let's face it, all the companies are in it for themselves and they're in it to make money for the most part. Definitely. So um, as I wrap this up, my last question was, what is your message to all the current students at CREW 
um, whether it's female who want to enter the energy sector or female in engineering, do you have any message that you'd like to share? Well, I find that um, I, I, I know I've heard, and I just heard it on NPR today, was that you know there are a lot of women who are leaving uh, industry right now, and you know you get frustrated. I mean, the frustration level is high. And I will tell you that in most of these layoffs, I would say for every male that's laid off, there's probably two to three women that are laid off or more. Okay. And so it's been really, really tough and you have to pick yourself up and say, you really need to be doing this. The problem is, is there isn't a lot of empathy mm -hmm. and, and I, I can't do much about changing empathy. Uh, it's, it's a cultural thing um, and we need to change our culture uh, to be uh, recognized that there are a lot of women who are head of households and that they need to be employed just as much as any male out there. So mm -hmm. I think that leaving, coming out, it's going to be tough. You just have to have perseverance. And yes, you will have, without a doubt, you're gonna have obstacles. Um, the, the only thing is that trying to connect with other women does help at least to be, have a sense of camaraderie, but you need to also network with men and try to see how you can contribute to improving their business or your business and bringing it into a team perspective. Because I think women are team builders. I truly do. And I think that they have a great opportunity to, to show the the value by being team builders and it takes a team to win any any game that you're in whether it's an industry or whatever it takes a very successful team and i think that there has to be greater recognition about what type of uh team builders that women are capable of being thank you so much for that and thank you so much for this conversation i've definitely learned a lot um, and I'm very grateful to have met you and even talked to you prior uh, before this. So I'm gonna now hand this to Michael and he'll take it from here. Great. Thank you. Um, Shama, thank you for moderating. Myra, thank you so much for spending the time. I'm glad our friend Bob Smith who joined us today and asked great questions um, connected us. Um, this is great to get your perspectives and the advice and counsel that you have for alums and students. So um, thanks for spending the time with us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I've enjoyed speaking with uh, everyone there and appreciate the opportunity.